Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, today, before we get started on our two-part video, I want to take a moment to talk to you, my viewers, and I want to thank you for the growth of this channel. Look at this, 12,734. It's hard to believe eight short months ago, I made the first video on my dining room table. It was very crude. I really didn't know what I was doing as far as making videos. I knew the science, of course, but I didn't know how to make videos. I've really learned so much in the last eight months having these chats. I've put an awful lot of effort into this channel. As you can see now, I've got my green screen up, I've got some good video equipment, and my sound has improved considerably. I think that I'm putting out some really good videos. I was looking through my numbers today and I noticed something that I thought I'd share with you, and that's this. Now this is just a little thing from my YouTube analytics, but I noticed something. I see 49.6 thousand individual viewers every month. That just blows my mind. And I got to thinking about that. I have 12,700 subscribers and 50,000 people are watching my videos every month. Now, I do this as a hobby. My main job is as a physician. I have a full-time medical practice. I spend a couple of hours every day putting together these videos for you guys because I really love the STEM education. I like reading your comments, and I respond to a lot of them. But I was kind of curious, what's holding you off from subscribing? Maybe we ought to have a subscription drive. Now, there's a little icon down there in the right lower corner. All you have to do is hit it and you're subscribed to my channel. And I'd really like to see that. Do you realize that if only one in five of those unsubscribed viewers would hit that icon, I could double the size of my channel by the end of August? Let's see if we can do that. Why don't you be one of the five? Hit that little icon down there and subscribe to my channel. Well, let's go ahead and get on with our video today. Who do you think our subject's gonna be? No, there's no bowler that has any science to explain why the Earth's atmosphere does not immediately burst into the vacuum of space. Yep, here we go again. We, we do live in a pressurized environment of some kind. If we've got a gas pressure at 14.7 PSI existing next to a vacuum of space at 10 to the minus seven tor, without a membrane, that pressure immediately fills the vacuum of space. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to let Anthony cook his chicken and I'm going to just periodically interject. Now what he's doing right now is he's setting up this argument from personal incredulity. How can you possibly have this 14.7 psi pressure next to the 10 to the negative 17th or whatever he's talking about pressure of space, essentially zero. And he says that you have to have a membrane between the two or else the pressure, 14.7 pounds, will immediately diffuse into the vacuum. Notice that he's first implying that the 14.7 pounds is right next to the vacuum. Second, he's using this elaborate 10 to the negative 17th number to try and impress you with how tiny this is. We're going to call it zero. That's fine with me. Fine with you? These ballers tell us that gravity is a thing. But I've recently realized that gravity is not a thing, and Einstein tells us it's not a thing, but everybody thinks that gravity is a force. Okay, so what he's doing here is three things. First, he refers to people that believe in reality as ballers. This is designed to reduce their credibility. Second, he says that he has this revelation from reading Einstein. Gravity is a thing. Well, according to him, gravity is not a thing, and he thinks Einstein somehow agrees with him. The third thing is, he switches gravity from being a thing to gravity being a force. Now, the reason that he's doing this is that gravity clearly is a thing. Einsteinian gravity is not a force, but it acts as a force in our world. So there is a force of gravity, which is something different than gravity in general. But we'll let him continue. So what I'm going to present to you today is that gravity is neither a force, nor is it even the current science. And I'm going to tell flat earthers that we need to be pushing the ballers to demonstrate the claims for gravity. 
and I'm going to tell the ball earthers that none of us have got evidence to explain the atmosphere. And even if we consider gravity to be a force as per fight the flat earth and George Musa, it doesn't explain the scenario that you have. We do have gas pressure. We breathe it, but we exist next to a sky vacuum. Now, as we listen to Anthony's presentation, I'd like you, the viewers, to consider something yourselves. His premise is that we cannot have 14.7 pounds next to a vacuum because obviously the 14.7 pounds would quote unquote explode into the vacuum unless there was a membrane between them. Now, what's special about 14.7 pounds and zero pounds? What would happen if you had 14.7 pounds up against 10 pounds of pressure? Would there not be movement of air? What about next to five pounds of pressure? Again, would there not be movement of air? So, we'll let him continue, but I want you thinking about what's special about 14.7 pounds versus zero that's somehow different than 14.7 pounds versus 10 pounds. So the reason for the, the claim is that if you look at the Action Lab, and all they do is they get little water balloons, fill them with helium, and when they fill them with helium and then evacuate the chamber of its air, you'll notice that the uh, balloons, initially, they float, but when you start removing the air, they appear to, well, grow. So when he first puts them in the, the small, then they're beginning to get bigger as he's removing the air, and then they get even bigger, but one of them appears to drop, and then eventually the other one drops. Now this can comprehensively and fully be explained by relative density. Now this is a good example of how Sleeping Warrior misinterprets things because he doesn't understand them. What we're seeing here is an example of buoyancy, not just of density. Density is a property of matter. Buoyancy is a force. Now, what's happening is the same thing that's happening to these bowling balls, which were from another one of his films. A bowling ball has a certain size. According to Archimedes' principle, when you put an object in water, the buoyant force acting on that object equals the amount of volume the object is submerged in. So if you take a standard size bowling ball, it has a certain volume. That volume of water weighs 12 pounds. So if you have a 16 pound bowling ball on the left, it will sink. If you have an eight pound bowling ball on the right, it will float. If you have a 12 pound bowling ball in the middle, it will be neutrally buoyant because the 12 pounds of the bowling ball weighs exactly as much as the water that it displaces. Now what they're doing in the Action Lab video is similar, but a little bit different and very interesting. You start off with helium in a balloon. That helium occupies a certain volume and it's held in by the balloon. That helium displaces a certain amount of air. Now the air is heavier than the helium, so it falls underneath it and the helium and the balloon float up. As you begin to remove the air from the chamber here, the pressure will drop down and the density of the air around this helium balloon will also decrease because you're sucking the air out without changing the volume to speak of. So there will be a point that the weight of the balloon and the helium in it over the volume of the balloon equals the amount of mass in that same volume of air. As a result, the balloon will hover because it's in balance with everything. As you continue to remove air from the vacuum chamber, the balloon will continue to get a little bit larger, but it's held in by the elastic rubber around it. And there will be a point that the air around the balloon is less dense and weighs less than the amount of helium that is in the volume of that balloon. As a result, like the 16 pound ball, it will drop down. So in normal air, the helium balloon acts like the eight pound ball, it will float. As the air is removed from the chamber, it acts like the 12 pound ball and it matches 
the density of the water. And then as the air continues to come out, the helium balloon becomes heavier than the air around it, and it will fall to the bottom of the chamber. Now, the one question that he is not answering is why does the helium start off floating and then sink? Where is the acceleration coming from? Well, that acceleration is found in the buoyancy equation. It's the acceleration of gravity. If this test was conducted absent the effects of the acceleration of gravity, the balloons would not move. The bowling balls would not move. They would stay exactly where they were placed because not, there is no acceleration or force acting on them to move them. That's Newton's first law. So what happens at this point is one of the balloons bursts, and when it bursts, it raises the question, well, what happens to the gas pressure that was in the balloon? Does it pool at the bottom because it's more dense than the medium it's in, or does it fill the available volume? At this point, the balloon bursts, and the gas pressure instantly does something. What it does is not important. The focus is on the word instantly. Now, this is a very subtle technique that Sleeping Warrior loves to use. This is the um, lawyer in him coming out. We have these two balloons. One of them bursts, and something happens to the helium that is in one of the balloons. But that's not important. What is important is the fact that in the write-up, they use the word instantly. He wants to emphasize the fact that the word is more important than actually what's going on. And his word is instantly, because he wants to use that later. This means that if our Earth was exposed to the vacuum of space, Earth would be the balloon. Instantaneous and violent, violent explosion into the vacuum is what happens with that pressure. So if this is the, the Earth's atmosphere, without a membrane, it's going to fill the available volume. It's going to immediately burst into space. Everybody can understand that. Everybody can relate to that. The problem is when you walk outside, there's gas pressure. So how is that possible? Well, Anthony, it's possible because of something called gravity. Now, gravity is something that you are loath to admit, but it is all around us. In the water, gravity pulls down on the water. If you are on the surface of the water, the pressure acting on your body is one atmosphere. If you go down 10 meters, the pressure acting on your body is two atmospheres. That's because you have the weight of the air above you, and then you have the weight of that 10 meters of water above you as well. When you get down to 20 meters, you've got three atmospheres on you. Gravity is pulling the mass of this water down upon you just as it pulls the mass of the air down upon the surface. That's why if we have 14.7 psi on the surface of the Earth at sea level, we may only have 5 psi at a mountaintop. And the reason the 14.7 psi doesn't go rushing up to the top of the mountain where the 5 psi is is because the gravity of the earth is pulling it back down. Well guys, that's the end of part one of this uh, episode. Tomorrow we're going to talk about Riley and Newton, the laws of motion and gravity. I think you'll enjoy it. So make sure you hit this little logo down on the lower right corner there. Subscribe to this channel, hit the little bell so you get notifications and we'll see you again soon. So signing out from Northern Michigan, this is Bob the Science Guy. Take care, guys.